When I test this PA speaker and measure the resistance I get across the terminals here, I get 0.238 kilo ohms. And when I measure the exact same speaker with my impedance meter, I get 5.9 kilo ohms. So why is that? Why am I getting a difference? It's still ohms. And why do I test at one kilohertz, which is why you can hear the sound coming out? What is this thing called impedance? Well, I'm going to talk you through how I like to think about impedance, and it's really helped me. So let's have a look. So we're going to be talking about these two guys, resistance here represented by the symbol R and impedance over here represented by the symbol Z. Now many of you are probably familiar with this uh, illustration of electrical current flow. It's a, brilliant, it's a brilliant illustration, I like it and I use it a lot, but as with all analogies, it breaks down at certain points in the real world. It's not, it's not truly representative. But for most instances, it's great to get your head around what happens in an electrical circuit. And basically what it's showing us is this thing, Ohm's law. So this voltage is trying to push the current through the conductor, but the resistance guy measured in ohms, he's impeding that flow. He's, he's, he's creating a resistive path. And you can kind of think of resistance like friction. It, it, it impedes the flow. It, it's like friction. So... In a car engine, for example, we get unwanted friction and we put oil and all kinds of, we make the, make the materials as smooth as we can and we get expensive oils to get that really slick and running freely. But also, just like in our electrical circuits, friction can be a good thing. So when you want to stop that car, we need these things, we need brake pads and they, they impose a, a high level of friction to help us stop. Now, the, this illustration, well, it's okay for... DC as I'm showing there, but what about this? What about when you're in a AC supply? Well, it doesn't actually it doesn't actually work. This illustration's missing one guy basically, and this is how I like to think of it. You've still got this guy resistance, but there's another one that's that's opposing the force, and we're going to call him X. So here he is, we, X is actually known as what's called reactance, and he's the, he's the opposing force to that current flow. Unlike resistance, he's like, the, he's like friction. This guy, he's opposing, he's pushing back. And there's two types of uh, reactance. In, there's capacitive reactance, which is obviously through capacitors or capacitance, and inductive reactance. So let's have a look at capacitive reactance first. So if we've got a circuit like this, where we've got a supply, and I'm showing DC here, because it's quite often a lot easier to get your head around it in a DC format first, and then try to understand what, what goes on in an AC circuit, okay? So we've got a DC supply, a switch there that I can open and close. There's my capacitor, and I've just put a resistor in because I can. And if we close that circuit, what happens is there's an immediate rush of current flowing around this circuit. Now I'm going to talk in terms of electron current flow here. In other words, the current flows from the negative terminal round to the positive, and that's purely because I'm trying to explain what happens in capacitors and what happens in inductors. Uh, otherwise, I would use conventional current flow, which of course is positive round to negative, okay? But when we initially close this, this capacitor is actually seen almost like a short circuit, and electrons will, will rush from the negative terminal, and they're attracted by the positive charge on this side. And what happens, because they can't get across here, because there's an insulating material, they, they build up on this plate. And because they build up, they repel other electrons that were on this right-hand plate here, and they get pushed away. And because they've been pushed away, there's now less electrons here, which means you effectively end up with a positive charge on that side. And <clears throat> when you get to a certain point, this, this capacitor basically fills up, a bit like filling up marbles in a jar. You can only get so many, and, that, and that's down to the uh, capacitance of the, the capacitor that you're using in a number of farads. That's, that's its capacity. And once it's full up, you can't push any more in. So now at this point, 
we have kind of saturated this, this capacitor and no current can flow. So it's actually now looking like an open circuit. So that, you can say, is basically an opposing force. It's opposing the flow of these electrons in, in the circuit. And it's basically impeding. That's where the name impedance comes from. It's impeding the flow of electricity. Now, I like to think of the effects of capacitance uh, as the same as when I'm pumping the tire up on my push bike. So when I get a flat tire, I come along with my pump, which I've got uh, here, and you basically connect this to your flat tyre uh, that connects onto the valve and then you start pumping but when you first start it's it's quite easy isn't it but as the tyre fills up then the pressure in the tyre gets greater and greater and greater and it's pushing back on that it's pushing back pressure on that pump so let's say I was trying to pump it up to I don't know 40 psi I'll keep pumping and the closer and closer I get to 40 psi, this is getting harder and harder and the flow of air is reducing as I go. Once I reach 40 psi, if I was pushing at a fixed pressure of 40 psi, then it would stop. There would be, there'd be a balance between how much I'm trying to push in and how much the tyre pressure is pushing back. Okay, But what happens in an AC circuit, as I'm showing now, the polarity of this charge will keep chopping and changing direction frequently and the frequency of that charge will change the amount of reactance we're getting from the capacitor. In a slow frequency, the capacitor's got time to charge up each time and we'll be pushing back more. But in a fast frequency, sorry I jumped a slide there, in a fast frequency, the capacitor doesn't get time to fully charge and doesn't push back as much, so it's got less reactance. So let's look at capacitive reactance then. Here he is, he's on this capacitor pushing back, preventing the electrons coming through, because he's pushing back with the same force that's now coming through. So the good thing is, reactance is measured in ohms, so that means you can easily relate it to the equivalent resistance with a, with a resistor, it's measured in ohms. But there is a formula for measuring uh, capacitive reactants. X is the symbol for reactants, and C being the symbol for capacitance. And the formula is basically that. It's 1 over 2 pi Fc. So F is the frequency in hertz, and C being the capacitance in measured in farads. So if we go back to our circuit, and let's assume we had a 1 kilohertz supply here and a 2.2 microfarad capacitor, then the formula would look like this. X, the XC, or capacitive reactance, would be 2 pi, 6.283, times the frequency, which we got at 1 kilohertz, or 1,000 hertz, times the capacitance, which is 2.2 microfarads, or you've got, to, you've got to put it as farads, so it's 0 0.0000022 farads, and that calculates to be 72 ohms. So let's go to the bench now, and let's try this and see what measurements we actually get. And there you go, I've got a 2.2 microfarad capacitor there. Got it on my impedance meter running at one kilohertz. And the uh, impedance I'm getting is 70 ohms. So that's close enough, near enough. Uh, there will be tolerances in this, in the meter, and the leads add some inductance and all kinds of stuff. But basically, we are almost bang on what we calculated. Also note this thing, which I'll, I will briefly touch on later. So I'll get in there a phase angle, that's called, of minus 89 degrees. So we'll come on to that later. And if I change the frequency, so if I go, so we're currently at 1 kilohertz. If I go down, um, say 400, the capacitor's now got more time to charge up, just like pumping the tyre up, it's, it's pushing back, it's having an opportunity to push back. So the impedance increases as we decrease the frequency. There we go. Let's go right down to what we got, 50 hertz. So we've got 1.4K now, and as we go back up the other way, let's go back to our 1 kilohertz there. Should get back to our 70. And if we go up a bit more, it will start to drop. There you go, 35 ohms. 
right? And the, the meter's now telling me it can't cope with that low resistance. That's why this is flashing. It can't maintain that, that dBV level. All right, so that's good. It all works. Okay, so that's capacitive reactants then. So let's go back and now let's have a look at this inductive reactants. Here's a circuit with an inductor. This is a symbol for an inductor. It kind of represents the coils of this inductor over here. And yet again, I've shown it in, in DC to make it easier. I've got a switch and I've got a resistor. Now what happens when we close the circuit here, the inductor, because you're passing a current through it, it will start to create a magnetic field, but the magnetic field around it already doesn't want to change. So it impedes the flow very early on. It doesn't want that magnetic field to change, but the force of the voltage overcomes that and eventually the field will gradually build like that and you get a magnetic field form around the inductor and the current then starts to flow. Now it's a bit like <clears throat> the way I like to think about it is if you imagine a, a big heavy flywheel like this and you've got a crank handle and you've got to try and turn this thing, <clears throat> it, doesn't, it doesn't want to turn because it's got, it's got a mass and it's inertia, it doesn't want to move. So as you start to turn it, it gradually goes, but then you can build up the speed as you're putting, more, as you're putting your pressure on it. So you get this thing and you can, you can start to turn it and you get up to the speed that you aim to get to or the amount of force that you're putting on it and then imagine that you want to suddenly stop it. Well, you can't, can you? Because the mass of this flywheel now has got so much um, motion in it that it doesn't want to stop anymore. You took all that force to get it going and now it doesn't want to stop. It wants to carry on going. And now, just imagine now trying to turn it the other way. So you've got to slow it down and then go through the same process of turning it the other way. And that's just like an inductor, okay? So if we took uh, an inductor now in an AC circuit, as we did with the capacitor, what's happening is the voltage polarity again is turning one way than the other, it's, it's uh, alternating. And that inductor, each turn is, is not happy. It, it, it doesn't want the current to change. So with an inductor in a slow frequency, like that, it's, so it's, it's okay, it will allow that to flow to a degree. Uh, but it really doesn't like high frequency because you're chopping and changing the flow of current. And just like the flywheel, if you was trying to get it up to speed and then turn it back again, you would really struggle. But in a slow, in a slow motion, it would be much easier. Okay, let's just have a look at an example circuit then. So here he is, here's, here's our um, inductive reactance guy pushing back on the uh, electrons from coming through. And Again, it's measured in ohms, and the formula is a little bit simpler this time. It's basically the inverse of what you saw with capacitance. There's no one over anything. So the symbol for reactance, again, is X, and the symbol for uh, inductance is L. So the formula is X XL equals 2 pi F L. F, again, being the frequency in hertz, and L being the inductance, which is measured in Henry's. So if we take an example circuit again, and we have, let's say, 10 kilohertz this time, and we have a 0.2 millihenry inductor there, then our formula looks like that. Two times pi is that rounded up. Our frequency is 10 kilohertz or 10,000, and our inductance is 0.2 microhenry's or 0.0002. Anyway, this formula now equates to 12.6 ohms. So that, that inductor is imposing a resistance the same as a 12.6 ohm resistor would. So let's go to the bench again and have a look at that. There you go, I've got a 0.2 microhenry inductor. I've got my, imp my impedance meter set to 10 kilohertz and it's given me a reading of 13 ohms, 13 ohm impedance. So again, very close to what we calculated. And if I decrease the frequency, I can't unfortunately increase because that's the maximum frequency this, this meter can generate. But if I decrease, then what you see, unlike the capacitor, the impedance also decreases, okay? And as we go up in frequency, it increases, 
Okay, so that's like the flywheel. You, it, do, it doesn't like chopping and changing rapidly. If you're doing it slower, then it's pushing back. It's pushing back less. If you're gradually trying to change the direction, it's pushing back less. All right, and unlike the uh, capacitor, this is giving us a positive phase angle. So we will come on to that. So we now know about reactants. This guy, and we know about inductive reactants, and we know about capacitive reactants and also it's measured in ohms and we've got this guy still resistance uh, also measured in ohms so let's say we had a circuit then which had inductance capacitance and resistance and we're driving it in ac of course then surely that's just like because they're all measured in ohms a series resistor this would have ohms this got ohms and this got ohms so can I just add them like that, as you do series resistors? Well, unfortunately not. And the reason is, well, we're dealing with AC here, and this inductor and this capacitor behaves differently at the various points in this AC sine wave of the supply voltage. So I'm not going to dwell on phase angle too much in this video because I'll be cramming too much into, into one thing. But here's an example. This is capacitive reactants here, and yeah, purely capacitive circuit. So the blue line is showing you the voltage alternating up and down, and the red line is showing you the current also alternating up and down, but you can see they're not in phase. And the reason for that is when you start, when you start the circuit, the capacitor is discharged, there's nothing in it. So as soon as you start to apply a voltage, well, it's, it's almost short circuit then. There's a big inrush of current in the capacitor and it starts to build up charge and the current flow will then start to reduce because it's pushing back against your supply voltage more and more until it reaches a point that that capacitor is now full. So at this point here, we're on the zero line here. There's, there's no current flowing effectively and you can see by this point here, the voltage is at its peak. We're, the current is at its minimum and the voltage is at its peak. And we are basically 90 degrees out. The current is in front of the voltage by 90 degrees. And that's called uh, minus 90 degrees phase shift. Okay. In an inductor, it's completely the opposite. The inductor actually opposes the current flow from the from the beginning but then it gets happier and happier with it and it allows it to flow and an inductor is actually plus 90 degrees um, phase angle okay so they are completely the opposite to each other so the correct way to combine the effects of resistance and reactance is to use an impedance triangle which i'm shown here and this helps you visualize the collective effect of your resistance, your inductive reactance, and your capacitive reactance, and how that collectively affects the impedance of your circuit. So you put your resistance here, and then you, because these, the inductive reactance and the inductive capacitance do completely kind of the opposite thing, as I've shown, you deduct the capacitance from the reactance, and that becomes your opposite of the triangle there and the hypotenuse is your impedance, represented by Z. So by using Pythagoras, we can come up with a formula to calculate our impedance. So the square of this side is equal to the square of these two. Or you can look at it like that. Z is actually the square root of the sum of the, those two squares. Now let's put all of this together then. We know the formulas for calculating the reactance of this and the reactance of this, and now we know how to calculate the impedance. Let's put all of that into a circuit. So if I've got a circuit at say 50 Hertz, which happens to be the supply frequency of the main supply in the UK, and we have a 100 millihenry uh, inductor, and we have a one millifarad capacitor, and we'll have a 100 ohm resistor. So to start off then, the inductive reactance is uh, 2 pi fc so 2 times pi is 6.283 f being the frequency we got at 50 hertz and uh, sorry it's 2 pi fl and l being the inductance which we got 100 milli henrys or 0.1 henrys so we've got here the equivalent of 31.4 ohms when it's driven at 50 hertz 
Now let's look at the capacitive reactants. So X being reactants and C being the capacitants. The formula for that is 1 over 2 pi Fc. So it looks like that. 1 over 6.283, which is roughly 2 pi, times 50, which is our 50 hertz frequency, times our capacitance, which we've got 1 millifarad, so we have to put that in farad, so 0 0.001. That equates to 3.2 ohms. So brilliant, we know the resistance of that, or the effective resistance of that, the effective resistance of that, and we know the 100 ohm resistance as well. So now we've got our inductive reactants, our capacitive reactants, and obviously we knew the resistance anyway. And if we pump that into our formula, which I've got here, then we end up with our impedance equals the square root of our resistance squared, 100 squared, plus the 28.2, which is that take away that. So we've got an overall impedance of this circuit now of 104 ohms. Brilliant, we've worked it out. So in the UK, we operate at a nominal RMS voltage of 230 volts. So that we can also work out is 2.2 amps. So we now know all about our circuit. It's got a, an impedance of 104 ohms and at 230 volts, that's 2.2 amps. But actually, there's another bit of information we can obtain from our impedance triangle. This angle here is actually the phase angle of the circuit as a whole, including all the capacitance and inductance and resistance and everything else. The phase angle being, as I said, the relationship between the voltage curve and the current curve. It might be leading, might be lagging, or it might even be exactly in phase. But um, given that we now know our impedance, we know our resistance, and we know the reactance values, then we've got all of the sides of this triangle, and by simple trigonometry, we can calculate this angle. So if we take the inverse sine of the opposite, 28.2 over the hypotenuse, which is 104, then we get 15.7 degrees. The phase angle of our circuit is 15.7 degrees. Brilliant. We know the impedance, we know the amount of current, we know how many watts, we know the phase angle. All right? So that is resistance versus impedance. I hope you enjoyed. If you found this video useful, then please click the like button. And if you haven't done so already, please click subscribe. All right? Catch you later.